Welcome to Crema Media's Polity, I'm Brad Doubleman. I'm at the Helen Sussman Foundation to meet with political analyst Aubrey Machiki to discuss a second transition in South African politics as advocated in recent ANC documents. Aubrey, the ANC has recently released a number of policy documents that called for a second transition in South African politics. What do you understand to be the meaning of the second transition? Well, I think there are several ways of looking at it because there are several questions that arise with uh, regard to why there is a need for a second transition. Um, I suppose the overall question is if uh, there is a need for a, a second transition, what was wrong with the first one? And it seems to me several things are at play here. Firstly, the ANC is celebrating its centenary and 16 months after its Mangaung conference in uh, December this year, we will be going into our, gen our next general election. And at the same time, we shall be celebrating 20 years of democracy. Both the centenary and 20 years of democracy call for the nation and the ANC to pause and reflect on what has been achieved since 1994. And to the extent that, as I keep on saying, there is a gap between what is promised by our democracy and what has been actually delivered, there is a need to start asking questions about how you address that gap. And it seems the ANC is suggesting that the gap can be addressed through a second transition. The question then is, what is the content of that second transition? The content of the first 20 years of uh, democracy has been dominated by institution building, by uh, building our constitutional order, by enhancing the democratic experience of citizens through focusing on uh, rights, um, freedoms, um, freedom of expression, for instance, freedom of the media, and, and things like that. So the institutional and democratic foundations are in place and seem to be sound. What is not in place yet, or at least sufficiently, is a, a transition from the procedural to the substantive um, as far as the content of our democracy is concerned. And it seems to me the second transition is going to be about addressing particularly social and economic issues, thereby making an attempt at bridging the gap between the procedural and the substantive. Is it fair for the ANC to blame weaknesses in the delivery of a better life for all on the Constitution? Or is it due to their own subjective weaknesses? Well, even that question um, raises several other questions. Firstly, is it the case that the weaknesses and failures of the ANC constitute the totality of what is wrong with post-apartheid South Africa? My answer is no. Uh, to the extent that uh, deficits in democracy, in delivery, um, in changing the lives of our people have emerged since 1994. It would be unreasonable to, fa to, to, to blame all those failures on the ANC. So we should look at the failures of the ANC government and other problems in society that have given effect to inequality, poverty, unemployment and other problems. That's the first thing. The second thing, it seems to me what is happening here is that some in the ANC are not only blaming the Constitution, um, but are blaming business and uh, the powerful in society for the failures we have seen over the past 18 years. And, and what needs to happen, um, therefore, is that to, to address these failures and weaknesses, we should move away from finger-pointing and, and blaming the other. But make sure that we have uh, dialogue platforms through which a common vision and a common purpose can emerge after 2014. Because if we fail to do that, we can blame one another all we want. The ANC can blame the Constitution, uh, business can blame the ANC, ANC can blame the opposition, uh, and so on. Um, that will simply divert us 
from the fact that as a nation we should unite around a common vision so that the 20 years after 2014 do become 20 years of uh, delivery on both the social and economic front. Is it not a contradiction for some ANC members to blame the Constitution when others have proclaimed it a victory over the struggle against apartheid? The, the Constitution is certainly um, a victory um, over apartheid and also is one of the tools we need to create a society that is the antithesis of apartheid society. But the constitution is not perfect. No constitution is. So throughout the life of a democracy, because the enhancement of the democratic experience of ordinary citizen must be an ever-present imperative, throughout the life of a democracy, we must review things such as the constitution as part of the broader process of reviewing the state of our democracy. It is therefore unreasonable and even undemocratic uh, that there is an expectation that because this is one of the best constitutions in the world, it should never be reviewed. The conclusions we come to may or may not be at variance with those of the ANC. The ANC policy document refers to the balance of forces changing over the years of democratic governance. Is this true and in your opinion, is the ANC stronger or weaker now than it was in 1994? Well, I, it depends on which indicator you use. If the indicator is delivery, a lot of the positive change happened during the early parts of our democracy. Um, and therefore, to that extent, if delivery is um, the indicator, state capacity and delivery are not where they should be and the ANC in that respect is not stronger. If the indicator is the electoral environment, if you use 2004 as your cutoff point, in 2004 the ANC achieved almost 70% support of the popular vote. But if you look at the 2011 local government elections, it seems the ANC is uh, trending downwards. If it continues to trend downwards, um, in a few elections from now, or even much sooner than that, uh, the ANC can trend below 60%. Of course, whether that eventuates or not depends on how the opposition performs and whether the opposition is able to consolidate the gains that were made, particularly in May 2011. If the opposition fails, then you have the coincidence of a failure by the opposition to consolidate and the failure by the ANC to deliver, in which case the question will be whether this downward trend in ANC support will continue or not, or the ANC will trend slightly upwards simply because a lower voter turnout arising out of unhappiness with both the opposition and the ANC may actually benefit the ANC. You make a distinction between procedural and substantive elements in a post-apartheid South African democracy. Why do you think this is a useful method in analyzing the situation? Well, if you start from the day Nelson Mandela was released, you must bear in mind that his release was not the release of a man. It was also the freeing of uh, millions of people's aspirations and therefore the creation of the expectation of a new society that would deliver a better life for all South Africans, not only those who were oppressed during um, apartheid. But if we limit ourselves to those who were oppressed during apartheid, we do need to ask the question whether our democracy is sufficiently delivered on the promise of a better life. If you look at um, poverty, inequality, um, unemployment, and how almost every developmental indicator is a racial content, the conclusion we are compelled to come to um, is that there is either a gap or a growing gap between what our democracy promised in 1994 and what it has actually de delivered, particularly 
to those who were oppressed during apartheid. Now, if that gap continues to grow, what we're going to hit along the way is social and uh, political uh, conflict um, with a class and a racial character. Thank you, Aubrey. You're welcome.